Hi, guys. Welcome to our last Hunter Cram class. And we've got we to to get to get the strategies. Yeah, these are all the different tips and strategies so that you have a great class. We are so excited that you're here. We are going to have an amazing class. So Olga is a fourth year medical student and she's going to take notes and we're going to email all of you her amazing notes. And Mateo is a Hunter College High School senior. He got perfect SAT scores. Perfect PSAT scores. He's actually a genius. He's like Mensa. So we're giving you a super genius. And he's going to tell you how he reduces stress. Olga, who's a fourth year medical student. And Ms. Queller is going to listen because Ms. Queller needs to learn. No, I'm kidding. I actually don't need to learn. I'm very lucky because I wrote this webinar up quite some time ago. Olga has been editing it. Mateo is helping. So we have learned quite a lot. So I'm very, very happy to share with you. But this is going to be an amazing webinar. Okay. So everyone should be good. Um, I think just for the purposes of focus, is it okay just for this one webinar? Because we want to keep it really mellow and we just want to minimize people moving around. Is it okay just for this webinar? Um, let's keep the cameras off only this time. Because I really want to keep the focus on the screen. I want to make sure everyone is looking at the screen. So just for this webinar, Olga will be on, Mateo will be on, I will be in the backdrop, but we're going to keep the webinar um, running this way because the whole point of this, again, is stress reduction. So we want to make the actual webinar itself very mellow. So let's begin. Olga, thank you for doing this. Mateo, thank you for doing this. Um, and Mateo is an active college hunter student. Mateo, will you be there the day of the hunter test? Um, I, I did help out once, but I won't be there this year. Oh, he missed the memo. It's all right, everyone. We forgive you. Olga, take over. Thank you, everyone. And we're really, if you need anything, I am one email away. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to put you on mute. Sure. So, hey, guys, nice to see you all again. Um, there's still some people in the waiting room, so we're gonna, just going to give them a second as everybody gets admitted. Um, I'm going to do my best to try to put up the formatting of the stress reduction tips up on the screen so you guys can all follow along. And Mateo will walk us through it, like he'll start and then I'll add my little two cents. Um, and then um, I'll annotate and highlight some things on the notes as well so I can send you guys this packet at the end. And yeah, that's basically it for today. The idea is to have like a very relaxed, chill webinar as Francis was saying. Um, and I'll be happy to stay on later to answer any questions. And after we're done with the stress management tips, um, I think we'll have some time, like the last 30 minutes or so, I can walk you guys through some strategies as well. Um, okay, so Mateo, you can go ahead and kind of take it away and then I'll, I'll follow you. Okay, students should refrain from studying anything new the day or the night before the Hunter test. This year, the exam is on January 24th, 2024. Students should not study from a new book or take a new test on January 23rd. Instead, students should lightly review old crawler prep Hunter materials or actual released Hunter exams from the HCHS website or look at practice questions throughout the day, but only briefly. Students should avoid spending 10 hours studying Hunter questions the day before the test. By studying intensely the day before, they will likely burn themselves out from stress and not give their minds a much needed break. Their brain muscles need a break too. One of the worst things students can do is cram the night before the big test. Cramming on January 23rd will bring a lot of anxiety. Please refrain. The night before, students can skim, not study, old hunter material. Research shows that learning brand new content the night before any exam hurts students because it crowds their short-term memory with last minute information. Cramming the night before can interfere with students' long-term memory retrieval and bias their decision-making skills. As the days approach the Hunter test, it's crucial to bear in mind that students have absorbed all the knowledge they can up to this point. The focus should now shift to reviewing what they've already learned. Parents are encouraged to remind their children that they've taken all the necessary steps to prepare for the test, and there's nothing new to grasp on the night before the test. So guys, this is very good advice because what you've done throughout all your studying is you've built up a library of concepts and skills 
um, that you're going to use on the test, if you try to cram in new concepts to that, that's going to be all you're going to be able to focus on when you're approaching these questions. And it's going to like take, like divert your mental attention away from all the skills you've built up throughout the past months to the, to the new one you learned like the day before. So it's definitely best not to do that. And yeah, definitely light reviewing is going to help you because it's going to be keeping those um, skills you've built up sort of very accessible for you, for you mentally. Um, but it's important not to, to crowd it out with new concepts. Yeah, I completely agree. The only thing that I would add on is that um, it can also just increase your anxiety. So even if you do questions that you've done before and for some reason you're having an off day, you're nervous, you did a passage that you've already done and you're getting extra things wrong, all of that can kind of, you can psych yourself out. So you guys have to um, understand that this last day of studying most likely will not make or break your score. Most likely it, there's nothing that you can do at this point. It's it's chronic, right? And you've all been working really hard for months. Um, so when we say light review, things that are fair game to review is like this webinar with like strategies, right? Like nothing brand new, strategies that you've heard before. You can review the structure of the essay, right? Because this is something that you guys know. I know that if I wake any of you guys up in the middle of the night and I'm like, hey, what, what does my introduction end with? You're going to tell me thesis. So these are things you already know. So it's okay to lightly review them, to make yourself feel better, to kind of, you know, make your brain go somewhere else except anxiety that your test is coming up. So those kinds of things are okay. Reference sheets are okay. So I'll share with you guys today a sheet with like math, divisibility rules, certain fractions that we memorize, certain formulas that make your life easy. Those things that you already know that you're just relooking to just make sure those are okay. But nothing brand new. Like tomorrow is not the day where you're like, I've never written an essay in this way. So I want to try to learn that tomorrow. That's not the day for that. It's not the day to um, decide that you want to teach yourself a brand new geometric topic that you've never learned before. Um, nothing brand new. Yeah, Neil, go ahead. What's your question? I have a question. It's kind of separate from this, but um, like Hunter released like an overview of the exam, and um, I was I read it, and it said that a uh, writing uh section, so the essay section. Well, um, consists of two separate essays, one for each page. So, um, how how should I go about doing that? Well, we talked about the essay yesterday. Two separate essays means two short responses. So you can reference those notes. I can resend them to you, or I can answer separately at the end because I don't want to take away time from the from these tips. Okay. Okay. That's exactly what we talked about yesterday. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next tip. Okay, stress management tip number two. Print a hard copy of your admission ticket and bring it to your test. Be prepared for test day. Hunter will send you a ticket via email. Please print it. The ticket has your student ID and exact testing location. This email can also be found in your Hunter account portal. Some students do not have a school ID or any ID at all. In that case, students can bring their admissions ticket which, which was sent via email. Students and parents can also log into the HCHS admissions dashboard to print their admission ticket. So yeah, we talked about um, you want to be like prepared the day before so you don't want to, you want to reduce your anxiety. And this is another element of that. If you're um, there the, the day of the test and you're scrambling around, you don't know how to refine things, um, that's just gonna like leave you a little bit frazzled before the test. and. Also, it may, if it's bad enough, it may uh, cut into your time and you might get there late because of that. Yeah, exactly. So be as prepared as you can be. Make your morning as stress-free as possible. So the goal is for you to wake up and you already know what you're going to wear. You know where your admissions ticket is. You know exactly where you're going to go. Um, you know what you're going to have for breakfast, you know what you're going to pack as a snack, everything is pre prepared. And our tips are going to go into that. And this is just the beginning of that. But it's all under one umbrella of just being prepared, um, which reduces your anxiety. That's our goal. You want to go into the test as level headed as calm as possible. Um, and 
that way also, if you have any issues with the admissions ticket, I recommend that you look even tonight with your parents after the webinar is done to make sure that you know where to find it online, that you have a working printer and that you can print it, um, that all those kinds of administrative tasks are done and no stress. Um, and that way, if there is a problem, you still have tomorrow to take care of it instead of realizing the problem is Wednesday morning when you have to rush out of the house and go to your exam. Um, okay, number three. Pack extra everything. Masks are not required anymore, but it is a good idea to pack one just in case. Students should pack an extra hand sanitizer too. Students can never be safe enough. Students should pack extra sharpened pencils, an eraser, and a snack. They can take anything students don't use back home or discard anyway. Apart from bringing their admission ticket, students should ensure that they have a minimum of five sharpened number two pencils, a high polymer or high quality eraser, their student ID, if available, a favorite snacks, and a small water bottle. We advise students to avoid overeating or excessive drinking before the test to maintain a calm and settled stomach, preventing disruptions. So yeah, this adds on to another element of being prepared and reducing your test anxiety. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that if you're in a testing room and uh, maybe someone like is sneezing a lot, like you might get a little nervous and like, oh, I don't want to get sick. So that's why, you know, having a mask or hand sanitizer can be good for that. And in addition to that, all the uh, materials that you want to bring, um, that's also that's just going to make you feel more in your element and more at ease when you're taking the test and allow you to just focus all your mental energy onto those questions. Um, exactly. So we don't need masks, but this is still part of like the big umbrella. I'll draw you guys an umbrella here of preparation, right? Th that's the common theme that we're going to keep repe repeating. Um, and if you're prepared, you're prepared for anything, then any problem that can potentially go wrong, you already have like a solution for it, even before the problem even arises, right? So again, you're going to minimize your anxiety. So things to make sure that you have, things that you cannot leave your home without, um, include obviously a number two pencil. And we recommend at least five, right? I mean, you don't, most likely you won't need to use all of them, but best case, right? What if you're super unlucky and the first pencil breaks and the second pencil breaks and the third pencil is uncomfortable in your hands and that makes you nervous. So it's best to just have options. So five number two pencils sharpened already. You don't want to waste time sharpening during your exam as your precious time is already going. Um, you want to make sure that you have an eraser that you practiced with before that's good quality, that's not going to leave a nasty, smudgy line all over your Scantron. Um, you want to make sure that you have your test ticket, which we talked about on the previous page, um, your ID if you have one. Um, and then we're going to have a whole separate thing on snacks and water, but already included on our list. And then honestly, COVID edition, masks. Uh, wipes if you want to wipe your station and you feel kind of, you know, self-conscious that it's dirty, um, hand sanitizer, all that kind of stuff. Um, okay. Stress manager tip number four. Students are advised to listen in to, to listen to soothing music such as calm piano melodies during the evenings leading up to the test week. It's important for both their mind and body to rest, to rest in the days preceding the test, not just the night before. Upbeat music can foster a more optimistic mood, while fast-paced tunes can stimulate and elevate energy levels. Conversely, slower tempo music is recommended to quiet the mind. It's crucial for students to relax their brain muscles and calm their nerves before a significant test. Soft music proves to be highly effective for relaxation and stress management. Yeah, so um, going into the test, you want a mix of an optimistic mood and a, and a relaxed mood. And that's why this is actually a great suggestion, so, sort of like calming piano music is sort of the best thing you can do to foster that. Uh, I love doing this. And guys, I recommend Chopin's Nocturnes. They're very calming. Uh, some of them can be a little intense, but for the most part, they're very calming. Um, yeah, so I would avoid listening to anything that's really like too driving or too too intense because you do want to have you want to be focused and relaxed and optimistic so optimistic relaxed focused i completely agree classical music um scratches that part of your brain that helps you focus 
Um, there's a bunch of studies that um, are about playing classical music to babies that are born premature and that it helps their like brain development. So this isn't just mumbo jumbo that we're feeding you. It's real science. Um, and I absolutely agree with Mateo's recommendation. Um, but honestly, anything that relaxes you as well. Um, I also like lo-fi, so I can add that to our list. Um, if classical music's not your best, lo-fi is kind of like modern music, but it's still pretty chill and relaxing. Um, and these kinds of things can kind of um, help you kind of get into gear and still be like awake enough to, you know, do work, but relaxed enough and calm versus something too stimulating can make you a little bit too nervous. Um, sure, somebody's asking to go back to three. Do you have a question on three or you just want to see the notes again quickly? And guys, I see all your hands. I'm just trying to um, save some of the questions for the end. So just hold on to your questions and we'll get to all of them at the end, I promise. Okay, so number five. Okay, trouble sleeping. Students can enhance their sleep quality by putting their cell phones on do not disturb and engaging in a mindful meditation an hour before bedtime. Mindfulness, a relaxation technique focused on being present in the moment, is beneficial during this time. It's an opportunity to, to express gratitude for accomplishments. Mindfulness includes practices like slow breathing, guided scenic inner imagery, and other methods to relax the mind and body, ultimately aiding in stress reduction. Excessive time spent on planning, problem-solving, daydream, or entertaining ne negative thoughts can be draining and contribute to stress, anxiety, and symptoms of depression. Mindfulness exercises offer a helpful way for students to redirect their attention away from negative thinking and connect with the present moment. So yeah, guys, being present is going to really help you. It's especially going to help you in your essay, right? Because in your essay, you're going to be sort of uh, conjuring up a memory, thinking about sensory details, and uh, really just like realizing that in writing. And the practices recommended in this uh, tip actually kind of relate to that, like guided scenic imagery. So that's definitely going to help you there, as well as, you know, sort of just keeping your mind with your surroundings and like with the um, with the current problems at hand is going to help you because you're going to have like real real presence of mind on the on the questions. But it's especially going to help you on the essay. Um, yes, exactly. The whole essay approach is kind of part of mindfulness and meditation, especially because they're looking for students that are individuals, that are creative. So you want to come off the way that you actually are, and you don't want to come off as like a robotic or um, anxious type of individual. So for mindfulness and meditation, there's many different, like different strokes for different folks, right? So different things work for different people. So um that can mean many different things. But what we do know is that across the board for everybody, um, it is important to be able to get out of your brain, right? So people have different approaches to do that. For some people, exercise does that for you. And that helps you have a really good night's sleep if you exercise before you go to sleep. For some people, they like winding down with tea um, or reading a book. Across the board, studies show that you should not be exposed to blue light before you sleep. If you want a really restful, comfortable sleep, I'm gonna big, put a big X and blue light. Blue light means anything coming from screens, right? So no laptop, no phone, no iPad, about 30 minutes before you go to sleep. And in general, this is a good practice that I wish that we could all employ into our lives. I'm not perfect with it. I will be the first to admit it especially um, with medical school, that does not always happen for me. But I do make an active effort, especially before I have a big exam coming up, like a board exam, um, that the days before, so you guys should start at least tonight, when I'm winding down to go to sleep, I work harder on my night routine. So I try to read a book instead of uh, uh, looking at my phone. I try to play a song on the piano or listen to music instead of scrolling on TikTok. So things that I know that are good for my brain that don't just make me feel good in the short term, but are good for my brain and my processing and my learning in the long term. So that's what's um, important. Um, so all of these things can help you, but you got to do them at least tonight and onwards, tonight, tomorrow, um, 
And that way you are kind of in good shape before your exam. Um, okay, you can do the next one. Yeah, tip number six. Uh, tip number six emphasizes the importance of arriving early at the test center to allow for a calm entry. Once inside, students should best should best identify the locations of the nearest bathrooms and exits. Consider poten considering potential waiting times before entering. Bring food, money, and a Queller pa pa packet for a light skin, disposing of any trash before entering the exam room. Students should avoid studying anything entirely new on exam day or the night before. While waiting in line, students should choose their line companions wisely as they may end up in the same testing room. Upon reaching the location, settle in before getting food. It's recommended not to eat two to three hours before the test and not more than one hour before testing um, to avoid feeling hungry during the exam. Since the pandemic, the Hunter exam is offered in all five boroughs. Most students will test at Hunter High School or at Hunter College directly on the Hunter College campus. Um, yeah, so again, the Hunter test, it's a very important test. It's something you're gonna want to arrive early for. Um, yeah, and because Hunter, it's sort of like a confusing building. You don't know whether you're gonna be at the, well, you do know whether you're gonna be at the college or the high school, but you know, you're gonna have to navigate. You just want to get there early because there's really no reason not to. Um, yeah, as for not um, eating more than an hour before, that's definitely true. You want to have a full stomach, but not an over full stomach. Um, and yeah, just adding on to that, uh, choosing your line companions is also important because I remember during when I was taking the hunter test, um, all the kids I was next or I, I was next to, they were all like frantic and, oh, I don't know if this is going to be on the test or like if they're going to test this skill. And they sort of got in my head a little bit. So that's definitely important, too. So in summary, you have to prioritize what's good for you. So you have to surround yourself with people that are going to make you feel good, that are going to, you know, do your affirmations, make you feel confident, make you feel like, hey, we got this, right? We're going to go in, we're going to take this exam. Not people that are going to be like, oh my God, did you study this? Oh my God, did you hear about this and that? Because then you're going to be like, oh wait, did I hear about it? And you don't, you want to conserve your brain energy for the questions and the essay and everything that they ask you. Not for all of this outside, you know, buzz and fluff. And some of it is normal. Like I remember in psych, I don't know if you guys have ever learned this concept, but you will if you go into medicine or study psych. But basically there's a healthy amount of stress, right? So there's, if we think of a graph of like stress and then performance, if you're not stressed at all, your performance is going to be low. If you're stressed at some point, your performance will be high. And if you have too much stress, your performance is going to be low again, right? So the stress and performance curve looks something like this. So it is our absolute goal for you guys to be in this window, right? Optimal stress, which is you're all a little bit nervous because you're taking an important exam. Peak performance, your absolute best performance. You're going to put in put on your best show yet. So it's going to be your highest score yet, right? That's our goal. If you're too not stressed, your performance will be low. If you don't care about this test at all and you kind of walk into it um, and you don't care, you're not, your performance will not be at, at its optimal. And if you're overly stressed and you're thinking, oh my God, I'm late and I forgot my ID and my car broke down and my dad is late and something else is happening and this guy is mentioning a math topic I've never heard of, that's going to put you here and then that's going to drop your performance as well. So stress is good, healthy amount of stress. So our goal is to give you all these tips to make sure that you guys are in this sweet spot, right? So to make sure that you're in that sweet spot, we talked about preparation of knowing where to go, right? So figure out where your test is. You should know that before. Figure out how long it's going to take you guys to commute there. Make sure that you're there early because who knows, maybe this is the day where there will be the worst traffic in New York City, or maybe your train will break down. Or maybe there's going to be a really bad storm that day and it's going to rain a lot and things aren't going to work the way that they do in traffic normally. So prepare for everything. So that way, even if you're a little bit late, you're still on time and your stress level doesn't get out of control. You also don't know what you're going to need. So come prepared, bring food, bring a snack. Um, you can bring a Queller packet as like a support 
thing. <laughs> Again, we don't recommend studying, but if it makes you feel better knowing that you have something there to look over, that's completely appropriate as well. Make sure that you understand your location so you know where the exits are, you know where the bathroom is. So if you do have to take time away from your exam and you go to the bathroom, you at least know exactly where you're going and you're going to limit the amount of time that you take away. Um, and obviously what Mateo was saying, make sure that you surround yourself with people that are going to keep you in your sweet spot um, and not make you overly nervous. Um, okay, number seven. Okay, tip number seven. Students should eat breakfast before the exam and snack before they enter the exam room. Students should eat even if they usually skip breakfast or avoid eating when they are nervous. Your brain needs the energy from food to work efficiently. You need to keep your mental focus on your exam and not on your hunger. If you cannot stomach food, try having a protein shake or smoothie. Also, students should eat brain-boosting, protein-rich foods, which can lead to greater mental alertness. Healthy food choices on exam day include eggs, nuts, yogurt, and cottage cheese. Good breakfast combinations might include whole grain cereal with low-fat milk, eggs, toast with jam, porridge, and oatmeal. Other brain foods are fish, walnuts, blueberries, sunflower seeds, flaxseed, dried fruits, and figs. Um, guys, this is inc this is so true. Um, you need good food to um, to support your brain. I remember when I was taking my SAT and I got out and I was just extraordinarily hungry because you burn a lot of energy just like using all of your brain processes. Um, so yeah, and definitely you want to eat uh, foods that are gonna that are good for your brain. Eggs are a good one, and chia seeds are my per personal favorite. I have them every day. Uh, they're very good for you. Your um, foods with omega threes. It's a type of protein, and uh, those definitely support your your growing brains. Uh, so foods like that include uh, flax seed, chia seeds, and fish. I don't personally like fish, so I just do chia seeds. Um, yes, cannot explain this enough. So here's the rest of the big list of brain food. Um, your brain, once you guys learn some physiology, runs on sugar. So you need healthy sugar to for your brain to work, which is why anytime I do anything that requires any mental energy, I literally always have a chocolate near me, like not even kidding, always. And I'm always snacking on it. So before a big exam, um, before my webinars, before anything that I really have to, you know, focus on, I give my brain that fuel. And like Mateo said, your brain will, you will, you will use that energy. So it's really important. Now, the reason why we call these brain foods, things like avocado, things like blueberries, fish, omega-3s is because those types of things are healthy fats and those keep you full for a long time because it takes our body lots of time to break down the fat. And um, it's full of fiber, so it keeps us full for a long time. So it'll keep you satiated for that three-hour exam. So when you're thinking about a healthy meal to eat before the test, you need to have a mix of something sweet, like a fruit that will give you that like simple sugar that will fuel your brain right away. But then something more fibrous, like oatmeal or chia seeds, that will also give you that length for you to maintain satiation for those three hours and for you to not be starving and out of fuel within an hour. Now, what I will add is to avoid anything with caffeine, don't drink soda, do not drink a Red Bull. All of those things are gonna give you so much adrenaline. And even if it's normal for you to drink th those kinds of things every day, on this test, you're going to be nervous. So you have your own adrenaline, plus you're gonna consume a bunch of caffeine and your heart and your whole body is gonna be shaking like this, okay? You guys are tiny people, your kids, your cells are not exposed to this amount yet. So you don't need to add extra stuff. If you drink a cup of coffee every single day and it's routine and you've been doing it forever, Drinking one cup of coffee won't do anything. I'm not saying to break that routine, but if you've never drank coffee before, Wednesday morning is not the day to experiment. If you've never had a Red Bull before, or in general, even if you have, Wednesday morning is not the day to decide to drink a Red Bull before your exam. So again, you do not want to do anything that will make your body feel anxious because even if your brain is relaxed, if your whole body is trembling and your heart is palpating like this out of your chest because you pumped yourself full of this external adrenaline, you're not going to feel good and you're not going to be able to focus on your test. Um, I also usually don't recommend for students to try any kind of brand new food 
Um, so if you really want to try one of our recommendations, try to do it tomorrow before Wednesday morning, because you never know how you're going to react to it also. So we don't want anything that will send you guys to the bathroom. Um, we just want regular, normal, healthy foods that you guys know that you love um, that will keep you satiated for a long time, but also have something sweet that will give you like that boost of brain energy that you need. Um, okay, give me a sec. Let me upload the rest of the tips and we'll keep going. Okay, number nine. Okay, dear parents, now is the perfect moment to pen a heartfelt letter to your kids. Yes, a letter. Take this opportunity to remind them of their remarkable journey and express how incredibly proud you are of their achievements. Emphasize that this test is just one step in their path, and regardless of the outcome, your love for them shines brightly. In your words, let them know they are the stars in your eyes. Encourage them to read this, to read this letter the night before the test for an extra boost of love and support. Yeah, guys, this is really true. If your parents uh, tell you, like, give you encouraging words, those words are going to stick with you in your head, and they're going to give you lots of confidence before the exam. And confidence really is key. Um, yeah, and you guys, you guys deserve recognition for all the studying you've been doing for this test, because, yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, I agree. Um, you guys deserve it, and hearing it from people that you love and you trust, like your parents, um and hearing it hearing it is always nice right so oftentimes you guys you we appreciate our parents or appreciate our parents appreciate us but on the day-to-day -day, everybody's so busy that sometimes we don't get to express it so this is a good reminder for everybody to just sit down remember what we're grateful for um express gratitude that you guys are lucky enough to get to be studying that you guys are lucky and bright enough to be able to have gotten to this point to have challenged yourself at such a young age to take such a long exam it's literally the length of the shsat and the sat um so you guys are making huge strides for your little uh for your small ages and all of that is worthy of recognition so this is just a reminder for parents and students alike to take that moment to express gratitude and appreciation for how far you've come um, and do this for each other and also do this for yourselves. You can do these for your peers, let your friends know or your fellow Queller uh, prep um, peers know that you're proud of them. Um, think about your progress. So even if you're not perfectly happy with your performance, like on your past test or whatever, think about what you were like when you started. Think about the first essay that you ever wrote for Hunter Prep and compare that to your most recent essay um, and relish in those feelings of improvement because they're really important. And we all start from somewhere and then we all grow and it's really important to track that growth. And then the other thing that is kind of corny but helps me is affirmations. So again, it's really important that you feel confident on the test and no matter who you look at, whether it's me and I'm sure Mateo, everybody, one, every one of us sometimes does not feel great. Sometimes we do not feel confident, whether that is about our academic performance or personally, whatever it may be, everybody has their days where they kind of take a dip. So sometimes you just have to remind yourself and you have to stand in front of the mirror and you have to make a little super Superman pose or superwoman pose and tell yourself like, I am smart, I am capable, I am curious, I belong in a learning environment like Hunter High School. I am funny, whatever it is that you want to hear. And sometimes just hearing the words makes your brain release all these happy chemicals called, called endorphins and you feel more confident and you feel better. So even if you feel super silly, you feel like it's not going to work, just give it a try. Um, and then the other thing that always works is just smiling, even if you're not happy, even if you're anxious, just forcing your, your face into a smile is proven to release those kinds of happy chemicals and endorphins in your mind and you automatically feel better even if you're happy having like not a good day or not a good confidence day so these are just like they're like life hacks they're literally physiological chemical life hacks that regardless of how silly or uh, annoying it may seem to do it forcing yourself to do it will have a positive outcome okay next one okay Plan exactly where you will meet your friends or parents after the exam ends, before the exam starts. Choose an exact location, grocery store, or specific building one to two blocks away from the test center to reconnect after the exam quickly. Remember, 
that you cannot bring your cell phone into the exam room for test security purposes. If you do, you must keep it off and out of sight. Most of the students taking the Hunter test are only 11 years old. Make sure that you have a specific place to meet your parents slash anyone picking you up after the test. Um, and important for parents, please communicate with work to have proper coverage. Parents will need five hours off while their kids are testing. The exam itself is three hours long. Students, please um, please email your school that you are taking the morning off off of the entire that yeah that you're taking the morning of the entire day off um, from school the day of the hunter test. Some students may decide to go back to their regular regular day school after the hunter test. You can ask your school if this is an excused absence. Students should communicate with their parents that they'll be absent that day. So yeah, this is very good advice because the, there are thousands of kids who are going to be at the test centers uh, taking this test. It's going to be pandemonium. You want to have a like a set location, an agreed upon location with your parents to meet them um, after the test. Uh, you don't want to be waiting out there in that crowd for like a super long time uh, when you don't have to, when you can just plan and and circumvent all that all that chaos. Um, and in addition to that, yeah, you should just communicate. If, if you just communicate your uh, with your teachers about needing to be absent the day of the hunter test, they'll definitely understand. Most teachers know what Hunter is. They know that this is a big test and they're going to be excited for you to have this opportunity. So as long as you communicate with them, uh, they'll totally be understanding and it will probably be an excused absence. I remember I did that when I took the test and it was completely fine. They, they were excited. Um, yeah, and also like the last thing you want to do is like not find your parents or your friends after like you guys finally did it. You're done with your test and you deserve to get out of there as fast and safely as possible and go do something fun um, and like go grab food, go do something relaxing and celebrate that you guys are done. So this is just number one um, for like practicality, but also for safety. There's a lot of people there. Um, flu and COVID is still a very, very real thing. Uh, so just protect yourself. If you if you know exactly where you're going, you're not going to be amidst all those peoples and germs for a long time. You get out, you go outside where you're safe, you meet with your friends and family and you get to celebrate. Okay, tip 11, take the day before off. Parents, consider letting your child stay home from school the day before the test to relax, sleep in, and do some light studying. You can always choose to pick up your child early from school around noon to get a few extra hours of downtime. Downtime. If the weather is nice, play tennis, go for a run, walk your dog if you have one, stroll around the block, and enjoy your surroundings. Use the crisp, fresh air to clear your head before the big day. Students should lightly review their notes and materials throughout the day. Students should not take any high high stress time tests 24 hours before the actual exam. Yeah, guys, so the day before the test is really your day, right? Like this test has an important weight on your future. So it's really, it's, it's, it, it really outweighs um, just being present in school that one day before because it has such an enormous potential gain for your future. And yeah, if you, um, if, if, if you do take this day off, you're going to really have just, it's all, it's, it's all about control and being prepared. And this just adds on to that. You're going to be able to, you know, um, yeah, study when you want to study what you want to, uh, like eat in like a, a way that, you know, will help you uh, help like prepare your brain for the test. Um, yeah, this is really just about like you, it's, it's your day and your day to really like get prepared for the test. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to eat how you want, eat to prep your brain. Um, also, like, it'll help you get into a routine. So like the day before, I usually try to wake up around the same time that my test is just to prepare my brain. Um, so try to wake up at the same time that you need to for the test. Um, the other thing that I really recommend is try to get outside. I know it's freezing here the last few days, yeah. it's really, really cold, um, but it really, really helps to go outside. Um, and it helps you, um, because you're going to get physically tired, right? The cold makes us tired. Taking a walk outside will make you tired. 
trying to walk your dog or go for a run or do anything physical outside when it's freezing will make you tired. And a problem that I have before big exams is I can't sleep. Even if I'm in a routine, I'm just like nervous and I'm thinking a lot and it's hard for me to sleep. But physically exerting myself the day of helps me go to sleep and helps me actually get a really restful night's sleep. So I always try to get a workout in or go outside, take a walk, at least something physical and not be kind of like um, a couch potato all day the day before. Uh, you want to be able to like stimulate your body, but not overstimulate your body where you're learning something new, but still have a like a, a busy enough active day. It helps the day move faster. It helps you not think about the test every day and like your anxiety builds. So uh, those would be my recommendations for the day before, like wake up when you're supposed to eat good food, the same, like to prep your brain the day before, like imagine you're training for a big race, right? So you would do all those kinds of things and then take care of your body, like do your routines. If you like putting on your skincare and your moisturizer, you do that. If you like um, working out or if you really like a TV show, do it. Do it all in moderation, right? Like one episode of your favorite TV show, light studying, one episode of your favorite TV show, going outside, eating good food, and that way the day will pass. You'll be able to sleep at an appropriate time and you'll be able to wake up the next day feeling like fulfilled, relaxed, um, and ready to take on the test. Okay, this is a long one. Um, tip number 12, time management. Students should bring a basic watch and set it to 12 o'clock. This way you can pace, your test to, pace yourself to test the entirety of the 180 minutes. Once the proctor says you may begin, hit the timer on the watch. Test from 12 a.m. to 3 p.m. according to your watch, regardless of what the real time is. This way you create your three-hour silent timer. Also, consider not wearing the watch on your wrist, but instead place it on your desk so you can glance at it more easily. If you have extended time, ensure your IEP and 504 test accommodations are fully in place. These accommodations will be clearly marked on your admission ticket and visible in, in my schools. Remind the proctor you have an IEP or ex extended time test accommodation before the test starts. Speak and clearly communicate if you have time and a half or double time. Confirm everything. You'll reduce your stress by confirming and reconfirming your exam details. Make sure you bubble your answers after each and every question. Do not wait or try to save time bubbling your answers at the end of the test. You will likely run out of time and frustrate yourself. It is a very bad idea to rush to bubble everything in until the end of the test. Do not do this. Queller's last big piece of time management advice is to start with the math, math section. You can take this test in any order. The exam starts with the reading section, but it tends to be very boring. Wake up with the math. You will move faster on math questions. Math is generally more interesting and more mentally stimulating. You can ace the math test section much more easily than the lengthy and often boring reading passages. Move fast. Those math problems uh, will wake up your brain. Okay, so this was a lot, but so I'm gonna go through it in order. So first of all, um, with the uh, with the wristwatch, that's just a that's a very very um, good piece of advice. The proctors they they will they will write like you know you have halfway left on the board. They'll they start they'll write like the times and like the end times, but a lot of times they forget to. A lot of times they write it late, and you want really more detail than that than you know halfway of this three hours pet, uh, test has passed. Um, as for the extra time stuff, yeah, you guys should, it, it adds on to um, being prepared and you really need to, yeah, um, you need to advocate for yourself and to make sure you get the accommodations that you need. Um, and so as for bubbling, definitely you want to take this advice of bubbling after each question. If you, if you, if you save it to the end, you're much more likely to be like all, all in a tizzy once you're uh, bubbling all the questions in and you're more, much more likely to um, miss bubble. Um, also sort of when you bubble after each question, it sort of like makes you revisit the processes that you took to answer that question in your head and sort of like checks automatically, uh, your answers. And finally, as for starting with the math section, that's very true because the reading section, they contain a lot of, uh, questions where you'll, you'll be debating between two answers, not really sure like which one to pick. And it, it can be a huge time suck. I remember when I was taking the Hunter test, I started with the reading section because that's the way the test starts. And I ended up getting to the math with only like 30 minutes left just because I spent so much time debating like the minutia 
have like certain questions on the reading when it really wasn't that important because it was it was one section that was detracting from one question that would be detracting from the entire rest of the test. So yeah. And as for math being more interesting, that's a, a personal preference, but I'm sure a lot of you may agree with that. And it will help you uh, wake up too, because it's more like direct reasoning. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think it's important to um, definitely, regardless which section you start with, I would leave the essay for last um, because the essay, the, they you need to make a cutoff score before they even read your essay. So you want the majority of your focus and your time um, to go towards doing well in the multiple choice because if you kind of bomb those sections, even with the best essay in the whole world um, that's worthy of being published, they won't even get to read that essay. So I always, always, always try to um, highlight to my students that it's important that you uh, understand what they're looking for and how they're going to be grading your test and then spend your time appropriately. Uh, you guys also know your your own strengths and weaknesses, right? So you don't want to be stuck on the minutia of one question. If you know that reading comprehension is your weakness and you're always stuck between two and you pretty much always pick the wrong one, you know that that happens to you. The test is not the day that that theme will change. It's not the day that you're going to break out into the pattern. Instead, you want to focus on what you're good at. So you want to make sure that the questions that you're good at, those are the ones that get done and those are the ones that get counted. So it's kind of a personalized decision. Um, but in general, this is a great uh, piece of advice and strategy to start with the math, to wake up. There's usually less math questions and it takes almost anybody shorter. Um, so that way you can kind of get on, like you start the race with a sprint, right? Because you're working fast and you're working on something that's stimulating and then you feed off of that energy for the reading and then you finally finish off with the essay. Uh, another piece of advice that I sometimes give to students is that you can read the essay prompt and then move on and do math and kind of let it marinate in the back of your head. Um, because sometimes like you read an essay prompt and you get lucky and it's something that we've practiced at Queller Prep or it's something that you can apply. And sometimes you read a prompt and you're like, oh, wow, I haven't thought about that before. And you need a few, like you need to let it marinate and then, you know, you'll come up with ideas. So oftentimes I'll tell students to just glance at the prompt first and then go ahead and start your, your test with math. Um, yeah, the ELA is can be extremely lengthy, the passages. So you have to, you know, constantly make sure that you're waking yourself up. The clock um, on the desk, I definitely recommend that. I don't like wearing anything on my hands. It kind of bothers me as I'm writing. So I like uh, having it there. And that way it's right in front of me and I can quickly see, oh, an hour went by. Okay, that's good. I'm a third of the way through and I'm already on my second section. That's excellent. Or, oh no, an hour went by. I'm a third of the way through and I'm still stuck on math. That will tell you to move faster. Um, and it helps you pace yourself in reading as well because you can quickly look at the time and say, oh no, I've been on one passage for like 20 minutes. It's too long and force yourself to move faster. So taking the test is a very fluid process. Every exam that you take is a little bit different, but you're constantly reflecting on how you're doing um, and kind of changing your approach like a little bit, not drastically as you go through the exam. Um, okay, maybe I'll give Mateo a break and I'll read the rest of this. Uh, conversely, you should be prepared for extremely lengthy, monotonous, two-page long, tiny font reading passages. They are super long and super boring. Remind yourself that you are reading for points, not for entertainment. Set realistic expectations. Manage your time so that you try to ace all the math questions and then get to as many of the reading as you can. The exam is about quantity. The more questions you answer correctly, the better. Keep your eye on the prize. Do not fall into the trap of reading every single word in a lengthy reading passage. We are not at the beach here and you are not reading for leisure. Read while holding a fully sharpened pencil and annotate as you read. Cir circle, highlight, star key points, read like a warrior. Once you identify the main idea, you can jump straight into the questions, eliminate extreme answer choices and select the best possible answers. The more questions you answer, the better. There is no guessing penalty, so guess on whatever you don't know. Many students like to guess C, but we recommend students mix it up. Students should choose a letter they have not picked in a while. Mixing answer choices up is better for the algorithm. No matter what answers students choose, they should answer every single question. Do not leave anything blank. Every single point matters on this test, so leave nothing blank.
Um, so yeah, to summarize, don't leave anything blank, right? We said it enough times. I'm going to say it again. Um, at the end of the day, even if you don't know, it's best to guess. Um, I also like to teach students about this and like you should know which questions to go back to. Right. So the worst thing that you want to do is you finish the test. You have five minutes to review everything. And then you're like, oh, wait, there was a question that I could maybe go back to and figure out in math. And then you're like scrolling frantically. And then it's four minutes left. And you're like, oh, my God, where's that question? There's three minutes left. And you just wasted really precious time. So what I usually teach students is there has to be a system for you to know which questions to go back to, right? So for me, I usually use like dot, star, and side, right? And I create to, for myself like a uh, code, right? So star means this was a really hard question. I have zero idea and I completely guessed, right? Like I have, I don't know. I, I can't even eliminate anything. This is like the worst type of question. Um, dot for me means I'm pretty sure, but if I had extra time, maybe I would solve it a different way. And then this is like an in-between where I was able to eliminate, but it was still kind of like an educated guess. And what I do is I create a hierarchy, right? The ones that I'm pretty sure on, I don't really have to go back to them because I'm already 90% sure. It would be nice to go back to them like if I had all the time in the world, but I don't need to. These that I made an educated guess, I want to go back to those because I already got it down to 50-50. So there's a really good chance that if I focus and I spend a few more minutes on it, I can definitely get to the right answer. And if it's really hard, I have zero idea completely, not my highest priority, right? If I really have no idea where to start with the math question, it's super unlikely that in the last three minutes of my test, I'm going to get this genius idea and know how to fix that question, right? So it's about finding the balance of knowing where to spend your time time. In a perfect world, if you have that much time, you'll go back to everything. But this way you have a hierarchy. And um, I also on the front of my booklet will remake these signs. And I will say, okay, well, this was number three, this is number seven, 17 and 24. And this is number 31. So that way, when I'm done with my whole test at the front of my booklet, I have this code for myself. And I know, okay, I'm immediately going back to three. And once I get down to done with three and I fix it, okay, now I can go through these questions. And then finally, I can look at the one that I'm really unsure of and see if something clicks in the last few minutes. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, other general strategies that they mentioned, make sure that you're bubbling in as you're going. Do not bubble in at the end. You imagine you're bubbling at the end. You made one mistake and everything is off. Like you skip one question, everything is off. That is the absolute worst case scenario. So you never want to put yourself like you never even want to be potentially in that scenario. So you bubble in each question as you go on and you double check, right? A, A, okay, I'm ready to move on to number two. C, C, okay, I'm ready to move on to number three. Make sure, theoretically, uh, per periodically, I mean to say check. I'm on question four. Okay, I'm bubbling in number four, right? Because you forget to bubble in one and everything is going to be skewed over one and that's a nightmare to fix. Um, let's see, any, anything else that you want to add, Mateo? Um, no, you basically covered it. That, um, that like having different, different hierarchy, like the hierarchy of, uh, starring questions is really good advice because if you, there's a, there's a lot of questions that you might be not a hundred percent sure on. And if you just use the same symbol for all of them, it's going to get lost. Um, and yeah, just to get about the bubbling in every question, that's very good advice because it's, yeah, it's basically... If you if you're if you're yeah if you shift it by one then you're gonna have to erase all of those marks and you're already probably like uh drew them in darkly so it's gonna be hard to erase so yeah very good advice yeah these are scenarios that we tell you so you are not on like you should never be in that scenario it's like what I tell my younger siblings you guys learn from my mistakes right I'm oldest that's how I feel about all of you guys learn from my mistakes right like we've been there we've done that we've messed up on the test. Um, I'll even tell you guys, I'm not proud to admit it, but I forgot my ID when I went to take my SAT and it was literally the worst, worst, worst experience of my life. Like imagine walking up to that counter and the lady is like, okay, ID. And like, I don't have it. And then you have to call your parents and your parents have to drive back home. And like, then I have to explain where my ID could be and they have to bring it. And I'm like completely frantic. And it's such a bad experience that my SAT, I think was like eight years ago. And I literally still remember it. So you do not want to be in that scenario. So so be prepared, learn from um, your siblings, learn from your mentors, learn from us because we've already tested. And that's 
where you come up with the best strategies from when you mess up or when you don't do something in a perfect way. And that's why we're able to give you guys good advice. Okay, next one, number 13. Okay, tip number 13. No matter what, use the bathroom right before you start the test. Even if you don't have to go badly, go, empty your bladder. The nerves can make you want to pee badly five minutes into the exam. Pee right before the test. While we are on this topic, you shouldn't have to rush to the bathroom. Avoid large cups of caffeine, anything from Starbucks, energy drinks, sweet soda, or juice before testing. You want to avoid being forced into taking many bathroom breaks during the exam. It is a huge mistake to drink anything with excessive caffeine before this test. You don't need caffeine or an energy drink. Your body will produce enough adrenaline on the big day to keep you awake. I can assure you, you won't be sleepy. The last thing you need is to crash and be tired an hour into the exam after the artificial stimulant works off. Avoid any artificial energy drink, especially on test day. You need it. Uh, three hours of steady test taking stem stamina. So yeah, guys, this is also great advice. It's a little, it's a little nitty nitty gritty, but it's true. I remember I had um I I didn't follow this advice. I had a, a big coffee the day of my SAT, and by the end of the uh, first reading section, I was absolutely like bursting. I had to go to the bathroom so bad, and you want to avoid that uh, situation because it's it's a distraction at best, and at worst, it's going to act actively take time away from your test. Uh, if you have to like go to the bathroom uh, during during the testing like during uh, uh, the sections um, yeah and as for the caffeine that's that's one element of it it is a diuretic meaning it makes you have to pee but in addition to that it's going to cause crashes um, which is something you want to avoid because you want to have just pure natural energy on the test you don't want to you know experience like fluctuations in terms of your energy levels Yeah, absolutely. Just force yourself to go to the bathroom, even if you don't feel like going. Um, just going to the bathroom might make you go. Um, just being in that place. I'm a super anti-coffee person, and that's coming from somebody who's in med school and studies a lot. Um, it's not the best thing for you um, if you can avoid it, especially while you guys are young. Um, and definitely nothing, art, no artificial drinks or sweeteners. Um, okay, number 14. Okay, 14, pack a, jar, uh, pack a jacket or a cardigan or a sweatshirt. Wear loose, comfy clothes and pack an extra layer of clothes in case the room gets too cold or too hot. You will never regret packing an extra sweatshirt. You will likely not re re regret not having one on a chill test day. The goal of your clothing choices on test day is comfort. This is probably the one day you can show up to your school to school in your fuzzy bunny slippers and no one will judge you. Wear the most comfortable clothes in your closet. Don't worry about matching anything. This is your day to color code nothing. If it's if it's not extremely comfortable, then don't wear it. Right. Comfort is key, guys. You want to control every variable of this test that you possibly can. Because you can't control the questions, so you should tr control everything around the questions, right? And in addition to comfort, you also, if you maybe have like a lucky sweater or something like that, you're going to want to wear that too, because it's just, just going to give you the confidence you need. You're going to associate like taking this test with all the memories of all the high scores you got in that sweatshirt or whatever. Um, yeah, and also packing more than you need is always better because... If you if you pack something that you don't need, you just have something extra like beside you in your desk, as opposed to maybe it's really cold in the room and you don't have a sweatshirt. Like it's always better to be over prepared. There's no point in not preparing for this uh, test in any way that you can. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, my advice is like dress like an onion. So lots of layers because you don't know if it's going to be hot in there. If it's going to be cold in there. You want to be prepared for every situation, right? So if it's hot, you want to be able to have something that you can easily zip off. If it's cold, you want to have something that you can easily put back on. Um, comfortable shoes. Um, you don't want to be in pain at all or uncomfortable. Uh, you don't, I, I, I think it depends on the type of person. Like for me, usually, even if I'm like studying from home or working from home, 
I have to change out of my pajamas to just like feel like I'm, you know, like put together, I'm focused, I'm going somewhere um, that kind of helps my brain do that. If you're the type of person that would rather just be completely comfortable and that helps your brain, then completely appropriate to be as comfortable as possible. So you guys all know yourselves and you have to make the choices that work best for your body, right? Like for me, putting on jeans kind of tricks my brain into like, okay, you're not home. You're not like in bed. You're not relaxed, like work harder. Um, but for my sister, she hates jeans and those make her uncomfortable. And she just thinks about how tight they are and she can't focus on her school. So for her, she likes, you know, chilling in more comfortable baggy sweatpants and everything. And that helps her focus. So there's no one strategy that fits all, but it's just important that you reflect on what's best for you. And that's what you do. And then good luck charms, absolutely, they increase your confidence. So there's like all these like old wives tales. My parents used to make me put seven grains of rice in my pocket before every exam. So when I took my SHSAT, my SAT, and my board exams in med school, I was walking into that exam with like seven rice grains. And in med school board exams, they're like pretty intense exams like that you can't bring like you can't have anything with pockets and they'll like check you and they'll pat you down to make sure that you don't have anything so I had to turn out my pockets and like these grades of rice are falling out I remember the security guard, guard was looking at me like I was crazy um, but whatever works right so your parents may have their own traditions and even though like it might not be something that's my tradition but it helps me feel good right because I know that in middle school I did that and in high school I did that so it's just a tradition that uh, feels good to continue and gives you comfort comfort in that kind of way. Um, so anything of that sort that helps you is completely appropriate for you to bring to this exam. You have a lucky blanket, a lucky pencil. You don't even have to use it, but you could just bring it with you or know that it's in your backpack, even if it's not directly on your person and, or on your table. And um, it will give you that kind of unspoken comfort. All right, guys, I think we're on our very last strategy. So number 15. Okay, test uh, test stress management tip number 15, breathe. Remember that this is only a test and no matter where you go to high school, you'll succeed. Between sections, take a deep breath and try to stretch out. Take a moment to breathe after you completed a tough, a tough reading passage. Uh, Re-regulating your breathing will help you refocus. This is a stern test and a challenging experience, but don't forget who you are and how hard you, how hard you worked to get here. Lastly, remember that any high school will be luckily, lucky to have you, not vice versa. You are a gift to any high school you attend. They are the lucky ones. Guys, again, this is such good advice. If you guys are here, that means you're willing to sacrifice, you know, uh, weekends and evenings just to like invest in your future. And everything that you've learned at Queller Prep is going to help you no matter where you go to um, uh, school. If you get into 100, then it'll help you very directly. But if you don't, it's going to put you ahead at your middle schools and uh, high school later on. Um, so that's definitely true. Um, and in addition to that, um, wait, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but yeah, so um, anyway, in addition to that, like you guys, like this is a selective test. Um, they select people to take this test, meaning that you guys have already, you're already successes by taking the test. And that doesn't mean you should slack off, but it, it, it should give you some sort of perspective because um, yeah, if, if you're taking this test, I mean, you've, you've already demonstrated that you're smart and this is sort of an, it's an investment in your future, but it'll pay off no matter what happens, like no matter, no matter how the test goes. Yeah, I absolutely agree. You can think of this as a risk-free investment, right? Any time that you are investing in yourself and you're learning something or you're bettering yourself in any way, it's basically risk-free, right? Like if I work out really, really hard, I probably won't be an Olympian, right? At this, at my age, I'm 25. Even if I work out really, really hard, I probably won't be the top athlete in the world, but I'm going to be better tomorrow than I am today. So that's kind of like a very corny spiel that I tell my students and my siblings and anybody else that will listen. You just want to be better the next day than you were the previous day, right? So you guys are definitely better today than you were six months ago or three months ago when you first joined Color Prep and started studying. Um, and at this point, you just want to, you know, like get to the finish line in a collected, calm, focused manner and like make sure that your performance will be optimal tomorrow. I mean, on, on Wednesday. And regardless of the outcome, um, 
you are still going to be successful. It's one exam, right? It's not the rest of your life. And the exams that you take in your life, they get gradually more and more important, right? Like, where do you go to high school? Then it's going to be like, where do you go to college? And then it's going to be, well, where do you go to graduate school? And then it'll be like, okay, well, what do you do now? Where do you work? And every decision seems bigger and grander than the next. But at the end of the day, you will be successful. There are many different paths to reach one aspect of success. And all of you guys will have, there's different definitions of success. So as long as you're working on yourself, you're trying hard, you're learning, you guys are already all successful in my eyes, okay? All right, that's the end of our stress kind of portion. That's the end of our tips. Um, what we'll do is... I can take questions and then I want to give you guys a break because it's been about an hour. And then when we come back, we can do um, we can just do some strategies and then I'll let you guys go maybe a little bit early today um, just to make sure that you're getting in your relaxation time. Um, OK, lots of hands. OK, go ahead, Magnus, go ahead. What's your question? Um. So could your pa could you have a passport instead of your student ID? Um, honestly, that's a pretty technical question. I'm not sure. Mateo, do you know? Uh, no, I don't. Yeah, I feel like a passport seems a little bit too intense, would be my like intuit intuitive guess. Um, I would check the Hunter website. Um, I could also try to do my own research and let you know. Is there a reason? Like, do you not have a student ID? Why would you want to bring your passport? Um, I lost my student ID. Oh. Um, we'll have to figure that out. So I would ask Francis, I would ask your teachers, maybe the, um, at the school they can give you like a temporary student ID or something. Because I know there's some students that don't have a student ID and they could still take it. They You don't need the student ID. So I'm sure there's a, probably a way for the Hunter test to look you up. Um, but I would definitely try to follow up on that and ask um a teacher uh or email mrs francis um like tonight so you have tomorrow to figure it out wait i don't have student id yeah if you don't have a student id it's fine there's some kids that don't have it uh that's completely fine um they'll be able to look you up i think you should still have a test ticket though okay thank you um okay who is left kaylee what's your question Kaylee, I guess no question from Kaylee. Elizabeth, oh, wait. oh, go ahead. Sorry. So when will we get like our results back of like if we pass the test or not? Uh, again, not a not a question for me. I'm not sure. Mateo, do you know the timeline on that? I think it's around April. Yeah, some sometime in April, I think. Okay, so it seems like in like three months or so, two to three months. Okay, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, what's your question? I have two, um, but like, if we theoretically got into the school, like, what is the time? Like, what when does school start? I think it starts like the way it starts for everybody else, right? Like around September time. So um, my school has this thing called PBIS card and it has my OSIS. So does that count as ID if it has the OSIS? Is that, do you not have any other ID, like a school ID? I don't think so. Then yeah, my guess is it would count. But again, make sure that you have your test ticket from the website. Okay. Um, Zoe, what's your question? Can we use like scrap paper for the math section? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there you can use the whole booklet. You can write all over the whole booklet. Um, that can be extra space, and um, they can also give you extra scrap paper. You can't bring anything and like take it out of your backpack yourself, but there will be scrap paper available. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Jack. Are we allowed to wear hats? Um, I don't think so usually in all the exams like no hats no hoods um and even when you try to bring a sweater try to 
pick one that's like doesn't have a hood because sometimes they're strict about that and also different proctors um, enforce the rules to different degrees so sometimes like people will be really strict about it and sometimes people won't care but it's just better to avoid that situation you, sh you shouldn't be wearing any hat um, obviously no ear like no ear devices or anything that could be talking into your ear like signifying cheating or anything like that um isla um would a mechanical pencil count as a number two pencil yeah they're mechanical number two pencils just make sure that the lead is number two and even on the mechanical pencil not on the pencil itself sometimes on the pencil itself it'll say number two but in the lead that you buy make sure it's number two it doesn't say anything about being number two um do you have lead okay, yeah so on the lead, it should say number two. Okay. Um, okay, Leia. Um, so uh, during the test, are we allowed to ask for like time updates? You're allowed to, but again, it depends on the proctor because if you're asking for a time update like every five to ten minutes, you're gonna interrupt the other kids in your in your room. Um, so the proctor, if it's like a reasonable and they haven't updated the time in a while and you ask, they will give you a time update and they'll put it on the board, but you don't want to be the kid that keeps asking every five minutes, um, and disrupts everybody else, which is why we also say that you should have your own watch. Okay. Last question, Matthew, and then I'll send you guys for a break. So you hear there's a long line. Uh, what time should we be there tomorrow? I mean, on Wednesday? Um, again, I would follow the instructions on your test ticket. Is that when is the exam scheduled for? I think eight a.m. Yeah, but should we be there like before then? Yeah, I would aim to be there like seven between seven fifteen and seven thirty. Okay, and uh, another question. Um, are there going to be clocks? Yeah, there should be a clock in every single room. But again, it's not. It's uh, it's not going to be a digital clock. It'll most likely be like the clock with the numbers. So sometimes it'll take you time to see it. You might be in the back of the, of the room and there's only one clock in the room, so it'll be difficult for you to make out the time. So that's why it's the best if you just bring your own um, digital clock. All right, thank you. All right, guys, so deep breath. We did the hard part. You guys are almost done. Um, everybody can go ahead and take a five minute break. We'll come back around like 7.17ish um, and then we will do strategies.
All right, guys. So as you come back, just throw a Don in the chat so I know you guys are back um, or put on your cameras. If you guys need a few more minutes, it's okay. You guys can have a few more minutes, but start start coming back. All right, so I want to just lightly talk about some general test taking strategies that are true for the Hunter exam and really honestly for any single multiple choice exam that you guys ever take in your life, especially standardized exams. Yeah, Neil, you have a question already? Um, yeah, just uh, one more thing about the essay. For mm -hmm. like a short response form, can we just write an intro, bo one body and a conclusion, a short conclusion? So I would stick more to the structure that we talked about yesterday, where you don't need like a, a full introduction. You could just do a hook and then you can like if you need a filler sentence to connect it and then thesis. So if that's what you mean by intro, absolutely appropriate. And then you have your body where you have at least two themes and you have your supporting details and your sensory details and you're showing, you're not telling and you're doing all those good things. And then you don't need, again, another formal conclusion. You just need one to two sentences in a conclusion where you restate your thesis and you tell me the significance. Why does any of this matter? Why is it important? So relate it to something um, broader than the topic you're talking about. Okay. So just like that, just like we talked about yesterday. Um, okay, so let's talk test taking strategies. So almost anybody that takes a standardized multiple choice exam will run into this situation. So what do you do if more than one answer seems correct or if two answers, if you're picking between two answers? So whenever I find myself in this scenario, I double check a few things. So number one, I ask myself uh, whether the answer I'm considering completely answers the question. And notice that I put completely in all caps, because this is the word that is really important here. This is the word that you need to be very literal, completely, not kind of answers the question, not partially correct, not so not partially correct. Not a true answer choice, but doesn't answer the question. Not something that's ne'er only correct under certain circumstances. And not anything that relies on any huge assumptions. So no big assumptions. So this is the first kind of thing that I ask myself. I am making sure that I understand what my question is, right? Like I understand what they want from me and I'm making sure that the answer I pick answers the question that they want from me, right? I'm not answering a different question. I'm not telling you like what's what's a theme, like what one paragraph talks about when they ask me for the main idea, right? I'm not gonna tell them a detail when they ask me for a main idea. It could be that that detail is true. It could be that that detail is mentioned in the passage, but they're not asking me for that detail. So I don't care if it's true or not. I'm looking for an answer that's both true and that answers their question. So usually something like this will help me make my elimination. Now, the other thing that helps me is the strategy that I call match the language. So match the language 
in the passage to the answer choice and to the other questions. So whenever you have a multiple choice reading question, they're going to tell you in paragraph four, right? Or they're going to tell you in line two. So they give you a place where to look. So what you do is you go back to that place and you read around that place, you know, a sentence above, a sentence below, a line above and a line below. And you look for keywords and then you look for those same keywords in the answer choices. So sometimes we get really lucky and they literally use the same exact words. Sometimes we don't get as lucky, but they use words with the same meaning. So even if they don't repeat the words exactly, the themes are repeating. I'm seeing words that are synonymous. I'm seeing themes that make sense. And those are the answer choices that I'm going to pick that are in line with what the passage is saying, almost identically in line. And I always say this to you guys also, but you can use the other questions to help you, right? If you weren't sure what the main idea is when you first read the passage, but then you did a question about the main idea and you used your reasoning and you eliminated and you figured out, okay, this must be the main idea of the passage, that question should now add to your understanding of the whole passage and should help you then answer all the further questions because you just learned something from that question about the passage that you didn't initially understand. Does that make sense? So all together, the questions, the answer choices, they should all tell you a story and they should all be under the same big umbrella, the same big themes. Um, and those themes should repeat over and over and over again as you go through the different questions, the same big concepts should come up. And all of that is a signifier to you that most likely you're answering the questions correctly. And you guys saw me do this uh, when we did that poem. So you can go back to the notes and look where I wrote match the language in the poem and you'll see kind of a direct example of, of uh, what that means. Um, okay, and then number three, trust your intuition. So sometimes you just have a feeling that something is the right answer, right? You can't necessarily prove it to me if I was next to you on the exam and I was like, hey, show me the exact line that proved that that's your answer. Sometimes you can't do that, but you just have a feeling, right? You're like, I don't know why I feel like the answer is C or I feel like the answer is D. Trust those moments where you have a feeling. Even if you're like, like initially you have a feeling and then you're like, oh no, that must be wrong. Don't let yourself do that. Trust your intuition unless you have a very direct reason for why that's wrong. Unless you thought the passage said that and then you look back and you're like, oh no, 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 that's wrong, right? Trust your intuition because you guys have been studying for a while and a lot of this becomes kind of routine and your brain subconsciously notice patterns that sometimes our conscious minds don't notice yet. And being a good test taker is all about seeing patterns. So sometimes you can't necessarily name the pattern, but you have a feeling that's the answer. You listen to that feeling and it's you listen to your first feeling. Do not change your answer unless you're like 100% sure. Unless you like literally you're like, oh, oops, I added wrong or I multiplied wrong or something like that. Because usually your first intuitive answer ends up being correct. And most students um, kind of uh, regret um, changing changing their answers. Um, okay, what else? Number four, you probably have heard this and this was part of our like stress reduction tip as well. Um, avoid extreme words in your answer choice. So what does that mean? You should not pick an answer choice with always, with the never, with all, with must. Nothing strong, nothing definitive, nothing extreme. So instead, you want to be looking for what I call soft language, right? Let me draw, let me use green, right? Red means stop, green means go. Check. Nice, soft language. You should pick a word like may. You should pick words like sometimes, right? Might. Seldom. Generally tend to, usually, 
probably, right? This is everything that we call, or I call soft language. Um, okay, guys have questions so far, any comments? Somebody in the chat said, I have seen students and teachers combining two small essay prompts into one large one. Um, I wouldn't do that. If they're labeling two separate an essay prompts, I would write like two separate short response paragraphs and I would label my paragraphs. If they wanted one big essay, they would have asked you for one big essay like they used to do years prior. In the more recent years, they've been kind of switching their approach towards shorter response essays probably for their ease of grading as well. So I, I would follow all their instructions. You do not make your own instructions. You can't say, oh, they wanted two prompts. I'm just going to write one. That's not appropriate. If they ask you for two prompts with two questions, you give them two answers. Labeled. Um... Other strategies um, that I want to talk about, sometimes um, you're in a situation where you have answer choices and the answer choices are very, very similar. So if you have very similar answer choices. So for example, let's say we have beautiful pretty, weird, terrible. So completely out of context, right? If there's no question, there's no prompt, there's no essay to read, there's no passage to read, just based on your intuition, based on my intuition, I can tell you guys that regardless of what the question is, the answer is probably neither A or B because A and B mean almost the same exact thing. So it would have to be a very strange situation for me to be able to say that something is beautiful but not pretty, or something is pretty and not beautiful. So this doesn't always happen, but when it does, it helps you eliminate. So when answer choices are too similar to each other, that's a way to eliminate both of them, because if I can't, if, if I can justify pretty, then most likely I can justify beautiful. And if I can justify beautiful, then most likely I can justify pretty, right? And I can't have two correct answers on this test. So that's kind of a strategy that can help us. So if two answer choices are very similar, both are most likely wrong and you eliminate. Now, while we're on the meaning of like words, um, another big, big, big concept that helps me uh, with my reading comprehension is the concept of connotations. So I think I covered this with you guys a little bit on like two days ago, but what connotations are, are implied meanings of words. So every single word sort of has its own definition, and that's like a dictionary definition. And then words have sort of hidden, hidden ideas that they carry. And those ideas could be positive or negative, and it also depends on the context. So it depends what you're describing. So let me try to give you guys a new example, one that I haven't given you in the previous classes. So let's think about a wet muffin a soggy muffin, and a moist muffin. Which one sounds the most appealing to you guys? Which one would you want to eat? Yeah, anybody. You guys can unmute and shout it out. The moist Mo muffin, Yeah, I right? think. The moist, moist muffin. Moist muffin. Right? Nobody wants a wet muffin, and definitely nobody wants a soggy muffin. But if I open the dictionary right now and I try to define the words wet, soggy, or moist, they're all pretty similar, right? They're, they all are under one kind of umbrella. They don't mean things that are too different. But 
when we think about it in terms of a muffin, we want a moist muffin. We don't want a soggy muffin. That sounds disgusting. And we definitely wet muffin just sounds strange. Like who wants a muffin that's wet? Um, so this one is clearly negative. This one is kind of like weird slash neutral. And this one is obviously positive, right? So in this way, adjectives in particular and adverbs carry connotations. They carry meaning. And authors can choose the adjectives that they use, and they're kind of hiddenly telling you their opinion on something, whether something is good or bad or neutral. So oftentimes when I don't fully understand a passage, what I do is I look at all the adjectives and adverbs within the passage, and I try to count them up. And I'm like, okay, this guy is net positive or net negative about whatever he's talking about. So when I choose a word, when I, when I get a question about the author's perspective, I then look for an answer choice that matches my connotation that's net positive or that's net negative, or that's neutral if that's the case, if they all are neutral. Does that make sense? So another example can be um, assertive, um, assertive leader or a domineering leader. What kind of leader do you would you rather be called? Yeah, you guys can chat it out again. Assertive leader. Assertive yeah. leader. Yeah, assertive. Right? Assertive, that's the good one, right? Assertive is a compliment. Domineering is like, oh, you're the only one that's talking. You're dominating the whole floor. That's kind of taking the same trait and turning it into a negative. So in both cases, we're highlighting the quality of, you know, leadership, of taking control of the situation. But in one case, the word that we're picking is more positive. And in another case, the word that we're picking is more negative, even though we're kind of describing the same attribute. So connotations can really help you guys understand the author's perspective and the overall tone of the passage as either positive or negative. Okay, um, another category that I want to talk to you guys about is figuring out what words mean that you don't know before. So tackling words you don't understand. So what helps with this is number one is the context. So let me give you guys an example. Let's say that I want to figure out what this word means, environed. And for you guys, you always kind of get a one-up because you don't get the word in isolation. You always get the word in a passage. So the word is used for you in a sentence. So let me do that for you guys. Let's say the sentence says, the plant was environed by soil. So three parts to this approach. Number one is always context, right? How is the word used? Number two is root word. Is there any word that you guys can think of that sounds like environed, that you know, that you happen to already know the definition of? That's number two. And then number three is replacement. That's when you take your answer choices and you replace. So if I give you options, let's say entrapped, Here are your options. So in replacement, you would replace each answer choice into the sentence. Context, how is the word used? What is its part of speech? What is its tone? And you try to pick an answer choice that matches. So what word do we know that sounds like environed? Yeah, go ahead, Neil. Environment. 
Yeah, right. What does environment mean? It's a, a an area with um different organisms and objects. Yeah, it could be, right? Like it's your environment, whatever is around you. Or it could be the natural environment or uh, where you think of more like climate and the earth. Um, so using those three things, then we now find an answer choice. In this case, the plant was environed by soil. The plant was surrounded by soil. So basically, they took the word environment and they are making it like uh, almost like a verb, like an action word. And um, environment means surrounding. So surrounded is that form of it. And looking at all the other options, the tone of the other choices is a little bit different. So hugged is personifying it a little bit too hard. Um, and the tone of this kind of sounds neutral and literal. It doesn't sound like I'm reading something figurative. It sounds literal. So I would get rid of hugged and swallowed because these are a little bit too figurative for the tone of the passage. And obviously it's hard to tell from just that one line. Um, it'll be easier for you guys to tell from the full passage. If you're reading like a formal type of article that is not being, you know, figurative at, at all, it's very strange for that answer choice for that one sentence to then be very figurative. And then you want to ch uh, choose entrapped versus surrounded. Again, other sentences around would help you choose. But just based on the word environed, environment just means around. I don't have any indication to suggest that um, it's more like intense. Entrapped is a higher intensity, right? It suggests something drastic is happening. I don't have any evidence based on what I have. What I have sounds pretty neutral. Environment is a pretty neutral word which is why I would go for a neutral answer choice. Again, if I had more context and different aspects of that paragraph could have been suggesting something more intense, maybe I would have went towards choice A. Does that make sense? So you're always making the best decision that you can based on the information that you have. Um, okay, and then the last thing that I wanna briefly talk about in terms of reading, and then I wanna give you guys like my little mat map cheat sheet is annotation. So honestly, anybody that you talk to will give you a different strategy for annotation. I know that there are some tutors that are like, you have to annotate 100%. This is how you do it. Everybody has their own spiel, right? So for you guys in this stage of your test taking journey, you should already have your own kind of strategy for annotation, right? The test is after tomorrow. So up until today, you've been practicing with some sort of annotation, some way to make your guys some way to sort of break down these passages to make them more comprehensible and to help you focus. So I'll tell you what helps me focus when I do reading comprehension. When I read, I like having a pencil to the paper and I like kind of following. So sometimes that means actually underlining, sometimes that means hovering over. This helps me focus, helps me not lose focus. This is not for me to kind of break down the passage in any way. It just helps me keep focusing because if I don't do that, sometimes my mind wanders and I'm like, la, 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 instead of focusing on like the words on the page. So that's something that I do. Now, beyond that, I have a system where I like to square dates or years, anything that they give me in the passage. I like to circle names. And then I use a squiggly line for anything that I think that's important. So that could be like the main idea. That could be the turning point. That could be a vocab word that I have a feeling they're gonna ask me about because I don't know what it means. Um, so what this does for me is anytime a question asks me about a particular person, Instead of thinking, oh, wait, I remember they mentioned that name. Was it in paragraph two? Was it in paragraph three? Then you go back and I'm like skimming the whole thing through like all my underlines. I'm trying to find that name. Instead of doing that, I now have a systematic way, right? My eyes can jump through every circle and I could be like, is this the person? Is this the person? Is this the person? Is this the person? And I could quickly get to what, they're what they want me to find, right? 
And obviously I vary this approach. Like if every other line, if they give me a passage about John and every other line is like, John said, John did, they said to John, I'm not going to underline John in every single sentence, right? That becomes ridiculous. But if they give me a passage that quotes John twice and that quotes Marley once and that quotes some other guy once, I'm going to circle all of their names. And that way it's very fast for me to find whichever part they want me to. Um, especially like when they tell me in paragraph two, John, right? Then I can jump to paragraph two. There's only two places that I circled and I know my evidence for that. My answer to the question is going to be in one of those places. Same exact idea for dates and years. And then the squiggly line for anything else that I find particularly important. Sometimes if it's a really difficult passage for me, I'll jot things down on the side. So I'll jot like the main idea of each paragraph on the side. Um, but not always. And again, your approach doesn't have to look exactly like my approach. My goal is for you guys to take a little bit from every single person that touches your academic journey, whether it's your teachers at school, the people at Queller Prep, whether it's Matteo or Francis, use all of our advice and make it your own because that's how you become the best student ever, right? Like you have to take all of this with a grain of salt and apply it to yourself. Um, what, you, what you know will work for you. Some people don't have any issues with focusing, so they don't need to underline everything. Some people are really, really fast readers and it doesn't take them a long time to skim, so maybe this isn't the best strategy. But this is what ideally works for me and I've heard positive feedback from a, a lot of other students. And then finally, what I mentioned before when we talked about the stress reduction theme is figuring out um, how you go back to questions, right? So having uh sort of um key for yourself to go back to questions right so dot means i can figure out with extra time squiggle means 50 50 guess star means i have no idea and creating a hierarchy for yourself so you know where to go back to. All right, so all of this was just strategies. I'm sure you've heard of many, many, many of these things before throughout all the different people that you've had at um, Hunter, at Queller, I mean. I want to quickly give you guys some math strategies. So this part will be shorter. I promise we're almost done. So number one is estimating or what I call the unit digit rule. So you guys use the questions to tell yourself how you should be approaching the problem, right? So if you see a question and this is what the answer choices look like, Let's say it says 10.17, 101.7, 1.017, 0 0.01017, right? Let's say this is what your answer choices look like. I promise you there, I don't know what the question is. It doesn't matter, but I can tell you that they are not testing your ability to get to an exact answer, right? All the answer choices have the same numbers. So you shouldn't be thinking about how to solve the problem or multiplying or anything. This ans this These answer choices without even the problem are screaming at you, estimate, right? That's what it's testing. It's testing, are you able to tell me if your answer is supposed to be in the ones, in the hundreds, in the tens, or in the whatever that is, tenths or hundredths in the decimal form? Does that make sense? So use the test to your advantage, right? This is telling me estimate. It's screaming at me, estimate. Do not waste time, waste time calculating. That's what the question is whispering. It's screaming at you, estimate. What if you have one that looks like this? 10.15, 10.16, 10.17, 10.18. Is this a, a good question to estimate on? What do you guys think? No. No, right? This one is screaming at you, do not estimate, right? Calculate me. That's what this question is telling you. 
It's telling you calculate me. Do not estimate, right? So there's no one type of approach that's going to, that I can tell you on every single hunter problem, just estimate, you'll get the right answer. On every single counter problem, do every single nitty gritty calculation, multiply everything, add everything, divide everything, get an exact decimal answer, right? I can't give you a blanket statement like that. And that's what makes the exam difficult. But I can teach you how to use the clues that they give you in the questions and answer choices to make those decisions as you're taking the test, right? So if you can estimate 100% estimate, right? Why would you waste your time calculating something? What if you mess up and you don't even get 1.17 or any of these digits? You know that your answer, these are going to be the digits in your answer. You just have to figure out the place. Um, now, if you do have to make a calculation, oftentimes what I use is the unit digit rule. So for example, let's say I have to multiply 3,724 times 47, right? Not the craziest multiplication, but it can take me a few seconds or a minute. And there's some room for error if you're working quickly, if you multiply something wrong, if you forget to carry a tens digit, if you add wrong. But all I know is that my answer has to end with eight, right? Because I have an eight here, I'm gonna carry the two. The rest doesn't matter. So I look through my answer choices and if there's only one option that ends with eight, I'm done, right? That's my answer. I don't have to actually calculate to get the exact thing. So you have to shave time off this test. And then I can label this question with a little star or whatever it is that tells me I'm like 99% sure that's the right answer. But if I have extra time at the end, I'm gonna go and multiply this out and prove it to myself, right? But the unit digit rule helps you move through the questions as fast as possible. It helps you not waste time on like little calculations because I promise you the test is not testing your ability to multiply. They know that you can multiply, right? They're looking for students that um, can think logically, can problem solve, can connect dots, not that can multiply. They know that you can all multiply already. Does that make sense? Um. Okay, now the other thing that helps me with math is you can always use the answer choices. So you can plug into the choices. So plug into the choices. So if you really don't know how to solve a problem, you can use the answer choices and guess and check. So that's the big benefit of this exam being multiple choice. So even if you don't know how to set up an equation, you don't know what the answer is, you can use the choices. And I usually start with like the smallest option and the biggest option, right? Because if the smallest option doesn't work, that like helps me eliminate it and think, oh, maybe I should go higher. And if the higher one doesn't work, maybe I should go lower. If you start in the middle, it's kind of awkward. Um, and then the, my last kind of tip with math that helps me is using visuals. I'm an extremely visual learner. So remember how I showed you guys how to solve the percent problems by drawing that little diagram for yourself. So draw diagrams for yourself to help you understand what the question's asking you. If they're showing you a pattern with boxes and they're showing you like the box pattern for one, two, and three, remember that question, you guys, that was like this and then... I don't remember, like something was shaded and then in the next one it was like this and this was shaded and then in the next one it was like this and something else was shaded and they asked you about like number 100. If you don't see the pattern right away, draw out the pattern for yourself. Draw out the fourth pattern, the fifth pattern until you start catching on. So it's okay to be visual, even if they didn't give you a visual. Oftentimes, seeing the question in a visual form helps your brain kind of catch on to the pattern, even if you don't understand it in the word form. Um, the last thing that I want to include in these notes is a little cheat sheet that I made for uh, my students. Where is it? A little, a little reference sheet that um, I use for Hunter students um, that I just want to put up on the board so you guys look at. Again, many of these things are things that you guys already know that we've covered like a bunch of times. Um, but here are some decimal to fraction equivalents, right? Just to help you guys. Um, I think some of it cut off, but I can fill it in for you. So obviously 50% is one half. This is one third. This is two thirds. This is one fourth, three fourths, one fifth, two fifths, three fifths, 
four fifths. Who knows this one? This one's not as easy. Yeah, good. Somebody put in the chat. This is one sixth, sixth. This one is five sixths. And this one is eighths. So one eighth, three eighths, um, five eighths, and seven eighths. So the reason why I think it's good to memorize these is just because it makes your conversions easier, right? So if you have 0. 0.875 times eight, that can look like intimidating to multiply and that can take a long time. If I know that 875 is seven eighths, seven eighths times eight is nice and easy. The eight cancels and I can immediately tell you that's seven. So depending on the type of math that you're doing, sometimes a decimal may be more appropriate Sometimes a fraction is easier to work with, and sometimes they want the answer in a decimal or a fraction or a percent. So that's why knowing these simple equivalents makes your life kind of a lot easier. Same exact mindset for squares. Um, you can always multiply these out, right? I know all of you can sit there and say 19 times 19 and multiply it out. But sometimes a question requires that you know a square, and if you know these off the top of your head, it makes the math go a lot faster. It's one less calculation that you have to spend time on, and it's a one less space for you to make like an arithmetic mistake. Um, other aspects, obviously the multiplication table, 20 by 20. Again, same exact idea. I know all of you know how to multiply, but doesn't it make your life a lot easier when you don't have to think about three times five, you know it's 15. So ideally, I want you to be the same way for all numbers 20 by 20. And then divisibility rules, which we've reviewed, and then certain geometry formulas as well. Um, so when we say light review, I mean something like this, just looking over the sheet, making sure you know these basics, you can play a game and have your parents or siblings test you on this multiplication table. It's something that's low stakes, right? Because even if you don't know 17 times 16, I promise you that does not imply how you're going to do on the exam, right? You guys can all multiply 17 by 16. But if you spend a minute reviewing this, it might make that calculation at least 2 to 3% easier and faster on Wednesday, okay? Um, okay, so that was the end kind of of my spiel. Um, I want to wish you guys all the very, 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 very best of luck. I will be thinking of all of you on Wednesday um, and praying and hoping that you guys do well. Please send me your results when you know I'd love to hear when um, students that I've worked with get in. Um, and if you have any last minute questions, I'll stay on until eight o'clock. You guys also have my email if you need anything like the notes. Um, or if you have any last minute questions, you have all of us as a resource, you have Miss Francis. Um, so anything that you guys need, we're here for you. We support you. We know that you guys are more than well prepared. Please don't freak out and just enter this exam with a level head and try to be as excited as possible that you're almost free. It's the best feeling when an exam is over. All right, so on that note, if you guys have any questions, I'm here, Mateo's still on as well. So if you have any questions directed to him, and if not, you guys are free to go, okay? Good night and good luck. And if you need anything, you have my email. Bye. Thank bye. you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Good night. <laughs>